Imagine a future in which all your soap was made out of air pollution, or your vodka was made from emissions, or even your engagement ring. Just kidding, don't get engaged. Truth is, it might not be so far away. The world has got to remove 1 billion tons of CO2 by 2025 to meet Paris climate goals. That means we had to speed things up like yesterday. Companies like Germany-based Covestro are turning pollutant CO2 into materials that go into pretty much everything. Mattresses, medical equipment, socks, sneakers, car seats, phone cases, insulation, floors. I could go on, but I won't. Sounds good and all, but is this really going to make a serious dent in our carbon levels? And what does recycled carbon even look like? Carbon capture has actually been around for decades. In the 1970s, oil corporations were actually the ones using captured emissions to pump CO2 into oil wells to boost oil recovery. We can also convert that pollution and store it in the ground. But why not recycle it into something else? This technology is called carbon capture and utilization, the hottest new acronym in town. So what can we actually use recycled carbon in? The carbon is in almost everything. This is Susan Fancy. She's the program manager at the University of Michigan's Global CO2 Initiative, and she is very excited about CCU. If I go into a clothing store, you know, most clothing is made from synthetic fabrics, and all of those are made from fossil fuels. Take this mattress, for example. Most of these things are made from polyurethane foam. Mattresses look simple. Meet Christoph Gödler. He develops products at Covestro, and he knows more about foam than anyone you know. So you have just a, a huge block of polyurethane foam, some 10 to 20 kilograms. So we take CO2 and we simply substitute a part of the fossil material that is needed to, to build up the, these matrices. This process replaces up to 20% of the fossil sources with recycled carbon dioxide. In the EU, over 30 million mattresses are thrown out every year. If they were all stacked up, the pile would be 678 times the height of Mount Everest. Meanwhile, Christoph has managed to beat me to my next The journalistic question is, you just have this methodology uh, at hand. This alone will not help you to save the world. I say, yes, you're perfectly right. That's not the intention. However, making these products can also use a lot of energy. Converting CO2 to polymers and fuels tends to be more energy intensive than other applications. We can do this uh, only if we have green energy. We asked Erga Derbeg, a very sensible chemical engineer, about the energy efficiency of producing recycled CO2 products and materials. This is, uh, I think, the main bottleneck. We have not enough green energy for the production of green chemicals as well as the production of green steel and so on. But we're not going to possibly save the planet by buying carbon negative socks. The amount of carbon dioxide that might go into chemicals, plastics, and fibers would be too small to make a significant dent in global emissions. It's between 40 million and 90 million metric tons a year. FYI, we emit 30 billion tons a year. So we need to be replacing carbon in much larger scale processes. And guess what industry is one of the best candidates for that? Cement. Cement alone accounts for 8% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions. For chemical reasons, uh, you cannot produce uh, cement without emitting CO2. It's one industry which has to emit CO2. Enter Chris Stern. He's really into cement. Concrete's not the sexiest subject. We're, we're trying to make it that way, somewhat. <laughs> he started a company that makes carbon negative concrete by replacing cement with steel slag, a byproduct of the steel industry. Chris has a very entrepreneurial spirit. Like, someone's going to do it, right? It might as well be me. Instead of, um, instead of trying to decarbonize cement, what we've done is come up with a process to replace cement. Carbocrete sources CO2 from industrial gas suppliers who collect and purify the gas from industrial emitters. But it's the technology his company actually sells. He worked with scientists at McGill University to develop a patent for a process called CO2 curing. This injects CO2 into a chamber where it reacts with the steel slag and converts into stable calcium carbonates. So how much CO2 is this actually offsetting? We avoid two kilograms of CO2 emissions by not using cement, and we can bury up to a kilogram of CO2 into that concrete block. The total blended abatement and removal is about three kilograms per 18 kilogram block. We can take millions of tons of carbon off the table by using this technology, it's a no-brainer. Today, around 230 million tons of CO2 are used globally each year. 
But so far, we only have the capacity to capture a paltry 40 million tons annually, and 70% of that is in North America. And if we can substitute more or less of this uh, fossil sources by recycled uh, carbon dioxide, then we can uh, reduce uh, the fossil uh, carbon footprint by 50%. But the CCU market is in its infancy, and we need to invest a lot more money in technology and infrastructure. How much more money? Lots of money. Everyone agrees, though, that the potential is there. Consulting firm McKinsey & Company estimates the 2030 market for carbon dioxide-based products alone will be between $800 billion and $1 trillion. That is, if companies can figure out business models. I think we we don't really know yet what's going to get commercialized, what's going to really take off, I mean, what exactly will work. So we're talking about a, at least a 20-year time frame. Which leads us to a bigger question. Do we believe the market can take care of the issue? Absolutely, 100%. People like me that are starting companies that are going to fix the problem, right? Like that's, how else are you going to do it? Typically, if people claim, oh, you're doing something that is more sustainable, who will pay for it? The consumer will have to pay for it. The new products uh, can be marketable, but uh, of course, they are more expensive. And this is a gap which has to be closed by uh, regulations or markets first. So your mattress might get pricier, but it's probably the right price to pay for, well, sleeping on a mattress. We can't acknowledge that we have an existential threat and then keep living the way that we did. Arguably, CCU's biggest impact would be in substituting fossil sources. But we can't think of it like an endless recycling bin. Ultimately, it's the entire life cycle of CO2 we need to pay attention to, where it comes from, where it goes, and where it ends up once the product life is over. So, weird question, but how often do you think about the CO2 in your mattresses? Make sure to tell us in the comments below. And because you love this video so much, don't forget to click like and subscribe. See you next time.